Since 1983, fame has helped business and education work for Maine. Contact the authority, the finance authority of Maine. You're watching Maine Biz Sunday, Maine's business news source. We're back with Bill Karen, President and CEO of Maine Health. Uh, we ended that last segment where we were talking about workforce nights. So I want to follow up on one more thing with you. Um, uh, doctors, are, are, are you able to recruit the, the physicians you need? I know that that's a problem in some parts of the state. Uh, how's that affecting your system? And also talk to us about nurses. Is there a nurse shortage? And then we'll go from okay. there. Yeah, the, uh, if you look statewide, there are probably 200 vacancies right now for really? physicians statewide. Uh, one of the issues we have around the state is it's disproportionate in that certainly you, if you look north of Augusta, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a greater need for physicians. So our ability to attract doctors into northern mm -hmm. Maine is, is, is much less than it is in the southern part of the state. But we're beginning to see cracks in that as well. I, we're, we're at the end of the line, mm -hmm. as we know, mm -hmm. and, and, it's, and we have a physician shortage approaching. And as those, that supply tightens up, it's getting harder and harder to recruit physicians into the state. Um, do we need a medical school, med another medical school? Obviously, we have New England, uh, University of New England yep. uh, School of Osteopathic Medicine. Yep. Does Maine need to have its own medical school? And can uh, it? Yes. Yeah, uh, that was the way I was going to answer the question. Is, <laughs> right. uh, the answer is yes, because yeah. we need something to supply us with the physicians we need. The problem is we can't afford a medical school right now. Okay. We, um, we've actually examined that. Maine Medical Center went through an extensive Are you teaching evaluation. Hospital? Maine Medical Center. Okay. Maine Medical Center on any given day has 200 residents mm -hmm. uh, uh, running around the place, and it's a well-kept secret, but mm -hmm. it's a major teaching right. institution. Right. But when the Medical Center evaluated it, they concluded and the board concluded that Maine could not afford the 80 to $100 million that we needed, really? and they moved towards the, uh, a unique arrangement with Tufts mm -hmm. in that we have a medical school without walls, a medical school program, where Maine students and others are now being trained in the state of Maine. Their third year, fourth year didactic training is actually occurring here. And the purpose of that is to, we believe that if we train students as well as when they're residents, mm -hmm. they're more likely to stay here in the state right. of Maine. So right. it's a strategy to right. keep them here. Right, okay. Uh, I want to move on to uh, the issue of consolidation. Clearly, you're growing, you're putting your arms around more of those communities uh, and those hospitals out there and healthcare providers. Uh, why is that a good idea? Why is it a good business model? Is it? Um, are there downsides to it? And in particular, I think the concern I have about it, when have you talk about, is how does it affect those r more rural areas? Are they still going to be able to have the quality and the level of service they have when they join a system like yours? Because yeah. that issue keeps coming up. Okay. Yeah, it does. And and you know the purpose of us putting together this health system now, 12 years ago, was to make sure that we could maintain the quality of health care in our rural communities, similar to what we have in in Portland and other urban areas. And so when, when a small hospital joins us, it's, it's all about protecting the level of service that's required in that community. And our system is a, is a decentralized one where uh, the decision making really occurs back at the local hospital. There are certain reserved powers that the main health, the corporate board mm -hmm. maintain, but for the most part, it's a system where the local community is making the decisions. Um, I want to ask you about, speaking of mergers, Goodall Hospital, um, the, you were moving down a pathway to merge with them, or they, they to merge with you, one of those join. <laughs> uh, and you decided to, you both, I think, decided to scrap that plan to bring Goodall Hospital into the network because uh, of what was called, uh, the FTC had, uh, was requesting additional information. I think there was, it was said that there was burdensome federal regulatory requirements. Talk to me about that. Why did that happen? And what were they looking for? What did FTC want? Um, I, I wish I could tell you we know all the answers because we, okay. we really don't know exactly what happened. But in the case of Goodall, we, uh, like we do when we bring any hospital into our system, we have to go through a regulatory review process. Mm -hmm. In the case of Goodall, we needed federal uh, clearance. So we needed to file what's called a Hart Scott Redino uh, Act filing and uh, try to get FTC approval. Uh, in the past, when we've done that with small hospitals, uh, we've met the exemption criteria, and the FTC has simply waived their review and mm -hmm. allowed us to merge. And when we looked at the um, Goodall transaction, Goodall Hospital met both of those criteria as well. When we filed, we were surprised in that the Federal Trade Commission concluded that they were not going to honor what is a 25-year precedent of uh, accepting those guidelines. And so they came back to us and, and did what's called a second request, right. which is an extensive request. We had concluded it would cost us and good all million, millions of dollars to comply with their request. It's, it's a request that asks for data going back to 1999, patient files and things. 
And so we, we concluded at the time we needed to walk away from that transaction and uh, hopefully revisit some okay. at some future point. So that's still a possibility that... At uh, some future point. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure okay. anything recent, but... Okay. Okay, good. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask you about Medicaid reimbursement for quick, to sure. give an opportunity to talk about that issue. You know, the state is notoriously uh, bad at, uh, uh, at paying uh, those uh, Medicaid reimbursements to hospitals. Uh, Stephen Michaud, the director of the Maine Medical Hospital Association, has said that lagging medical reimbursements forces hospitals to postpone investments and suppress wages. Uh, weigh in on it. How is it affecting you guys? It, it, it affects us because it affects every hospital in the state. Um, you know, and it's a problem that goes back a number of years. It goes back probably 10 years now where, as a strategy, what we did as a state to improve access, we expanded our Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and it was successful in that we now have better coverage or, or fewer uninsured than most states on a percentage basis. But we got there by expanding a Medicaid program. And, and what people realized after that expansion was you had to get a third of those dollars out of the general fund. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is it put pressure on the general fund. The state fell behind. Uh, now, Governor Baldacci has been um, a, a strong advocate for paying back hospitals those amounts right. that are past due and, and has been very helpful in working with the hospitals. The reality is we still sit here several years in arrears, uh, not as bad as we were two years ago because several hundred million dollars of been paid to hospitals over the past three years, right. uh, but we're still significantly behind. Okay, okay. Um, I want to end the segment, segment with uh, asking a question about uh, executive pay. That issue has come up as well. Okay. We'll this again. <laughs> uh, we get we get CEOs here. So we got to ask that. There you go. Got to go. Um, I mean, it's interesting because Maine Biz uh, had a question of the week in their in their online survey in February that asked about healthcare CEO compensation. Eighty-one percent of the readers said that there should be more. That there should be more accountability for executive compensations in Maine hospitals and healthcare organizations. And also in the Sun Journal, uh, recently in a recent, uh, lengthy article, uh, they talked about it as well. Uh, and there, were, there was a quote there from uh, Representative Peggy Rotundo, who said that, as quote, as we struggle to find ways to control health care costs, these huge salaries do raise eyebrows in the State House and have led to lots of conversation among appropriations committee members. So, what do you think? On, on the question of um, transparency, yes. uh, you know, there are, if you look at the 39 hospitals in the state of Maine, if, if the average board size is 20 individuals on the board, mm -hmm. that tells you that there are between 750 and 800 Maine citizens looking at CEO compensation for, for health care um, uh, executives. I, I can only describe how our system works, mm -hmm. and, and I can tell you that it's, it's one where we go through a process where an outside consultant is brought in benchmarks are established for each of the executive okay. positions that we have and then it's up to that not-for-profit community volunteer board to position the executives compensation in line with those benchmarks okay we're going to stop there right now but we are going to keep you around because we're going to okay. do an afterthought Great. segment that's going to be seen on the web we want to talk get your get you away on national health care reform and uh dirigo and anthem health and all those <laughs> other good things that you can only see on the web so stick around Great. Thanks. stay around with us we'll be right back Maine Biz Sunday is made possible in part by funding provided by the Finance Authority of Maine.